Okay, in this video, um, video B, we're going to pick up with the pharynx. This is your throat. We already know a lot about the pharynx from respiratory. Um, only the oropharynx and the laryngeal pharynx are actually part of the alimentary canal uh, and goes over the two sets of tonsils, palatine and linguinal. They perform defensive functions and protect from pathogens. Um, the primary function of the pharynx is propulsion, basically swallowing. Uh, and this is when the bolus passes from the pharynx into the esophagus. Um, and the esophagus is a muscular tube. Um, it is very, it's 25 centimeters long. It's found from the posterior um, to the trachea. Uh, and this is how the bolus gets from the pharynx to the stomach. Um, the mucosa is stratified squamous, non-keratinized, so it does have um, you know, some protection measure there from the food. Um, it secretes mucus to help lubricate the bolus as it passes down. Um, where the pharynx and the esophagus meet, there is a... Um, muscularis externa, which is a sphincter called the upper esophageal sphincter. This controls the passage of bolus into the esophagus. And then at the other end, the bottom of the esophagus, is another sphincter called the gastroesophageal sphincter, um, also called the lower esophageal sphincter. And it's going to regulate the stomach pass the bolus passing into the stomach. It also prevents um, contents of the stomach from re-entering up into the esophagus. Um, primary functions are secretion of, for the esophagus, mainly that secretion is just mucus. Um, during swallowing, skeletal muscle and smooth muscle undergo peristalsis, and peristalsis pushes the bolus down. Um, there is that thick epithelium, and it protects the esophagus from abrasion of the food. It also prevents any absorption from taking place, because we don't want absorption to take place until we get into the intestines. Um, Let's look at swallowing or deglutition. It's a specialized type of propulsion, and it's going to push the food from uh, the oral cavity through the pharynx into the esophagus. Um, it does rely on some coordinated action of that upper canal, um, the soft palate, the pharynx, and the esophagus, and even the tongue. Tongue plays an, uh, plays an important role here. Um, and the tongue is the only accessory organ to directly participate in motility. Now, there are three phases of swallowing. Voluntary, this is when the tongue pushes the bolus backwards into the oropharynx. You control that. Then you have the pharyngeal phar uh, phase, the bolus enters the oropharynx, um, the soft palate and the epiglottis seal off the larynx and the nasopharynx uh, to prevent food from getting down where only air needs to go. We've talked about that in respiratory. And then the third phase is the esophageal phase. And this is when peristalsis moves the bolus down the, the esophagus into the stomach. All right, so let's get to the stomach. Um, the esophagus, of course, pierces through the diaphragm, passes through the esophageal hiatus, and it empties into a J-shaped organ called the stomach. Um, there is some anatomy, gross anatomy of the stomach. There you have the curvatures. Um, you have the gastric rug, which are the longitudinal wrinkles there. And then you have your five anatomic regions. Um, the cardia, which is where the esophagus empties into the stomach. Um, that it receives bolus when the gastroesophageal sphincter relaxes. The fundus is the domed portion. The body's the main part of the pyloric region is the narrow end. Um, the very bottom or the terminal part of the stomach is called the pylorus, and this is where it enters into the small intestine. Um, it does have a sphincter, the pyloric sphincter there, that controls the flow of food between the stomach and small intestine. Um, the stomach has the same four layers that the rest of the canal does. It has an oblique layer, which is an additional layer um, that helps the stomach perform churning, which is a motion that turns food into chyme, which is a liquid form of the food. Um, the mucosa is heavily indented with gastric pits. They have columnar cells and goblet cells. Of course, they're going to secrete a thick mucus to line and protect the cells of the stomach from its own secretions. And you probably already know where we're going here. We're getting into to the, uh, the stomach acid and how that your cells of the stomach have to be protected from that very strong acid. Um, we have gastric glands found at the base of these gastric pits, um, and they contain both endocrine cells that secrete hormones into the blood and exocrine cells that secrete gastric juice, which is a very acidic, highly enzyme-containing fluid, and it secretes that gastric juice into the main lumen of the stomach. Here's your little picture showing the histology. 
Okay, so let's talk about the four main types of cells that are in these gastric glands. Right here is a picture of this gastric pit. The top part is the gastric pit, uh, mainly goblet cells and some mucus, thick mucus cells. Um, and you can see that thick layer of mucus there. And then the inferior portion is the gastric gland. So this is where we're going to get into the different types of cells. Located at the very bottom are the enteroendocrine cells. They secrete the hormones. The hormones influence digestion. Um, for example, gastrin is a hormone that stimulates acid secretion. Um, and then next you have have chief cells, and chief cells secrete the pepsinogen, which is an inactive precursor enzyme. It's called pepsinogen. When pepsinogen encounters an acidic pH, it becomes pepsin. Pepsin is the active enzyme. That starts protein digestion in the stomach. So one more time. Chief cells make pepsinogen, which is the inactive enzyme. When pepsinogen comes in contact with an acidic pH, it forms the active enzyme pepsin, and pepsin breaks down proteins in the stomach. You also have parietal cells. They're the ones that are going to secrete hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is responsible for the very low pH in the stomach. Um, acid is an important part of the gastric juice because it, we just learned it activates pepsinogen. Uh, it destroys disease-causing organisms. And it stimulates the parietal cell production of the chemical intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factor is required in order for your intestines to absorb vitamin B12. Probably heard how important vitamin B12 is to metabolism, um, and the intrinsic factor is the only way the intestine can absorb that vitamin B12. Um, it's great and fine if you get stuff in, in the intestines, but if the intestines don't absorb it, it's just going to be defecated from the body. Um, and then the last four, the fourth type of cell are the neck cells or your mucosa neck cells. They're located near the top. They're the ones that secrete the acidic mucus that prevents the neutralization of acid produced by the parietal cells. So it's going to help prevent and maintain that low stomach pH. Okay, so here are some functions. Um, there are three primary functions, secretion, propulsion, and digestion. Um, so we'll start with the acid secretion. Uh, of course, the gastric glands um, secrete multiple exergen products, which produce the hydrochloric acid that's released by the parietal cells. Um, it's continuously secreted throughout the day um, in between meals. This is called your basal rate. Uh, now, during eating, secretion can be divided into three phases, the cephalic, the gastric, and the intestinal. Intestinal. Um, so the initial cephalic is mediated by smelling food, seeing food, thinking about food, or tasting food. And basically this is what prepares the stomach to receive the food. And, and what it does is it increases the release of hydrogens on, into the stomach. Then you have the gastric phase, and this starts when food enters the stomach, um, and it continues that stimulation that was started in the cephalic phase. Um, there are two stimuli that trigger acid secretion during this time. The first is the presence of food in the stomach. It distends the stomach wall. That stimulates neurons to continue producing um, these uh, secretions. And then the second part is the presence of partially digested proteins in the gastric juice. That stimulates the enteroendocrine cell to produce and release gastrin, which then in turn stimulates acid secretion. The last one is the intestinal phase. This is the final phase of gastric acid secretion. Uh, and it's only responsible for about 10% of the remaining acid there. Um, it's triggered by the partially digested proteins in the fluid. They enter the duodenum, which is the initial part of the small intestine. That triggers uh, the enteroendocrine cells to release intestinal gastrin. And that hormone has the same effect um, as gastrin that's produced by the stomach. It stimulates hydrogen ion secretion from those parietal cells. Um, the stimulatory effect of the intestinal phase is brief. Okay, so as chyme enters the duodenum, um, the declining pH and the presence of lipids 
trigger the enterogastric reflex, which decreases vagal activity and acid secretion. So once this chyme gets into the small intestines, the pH is going to encounter a much different pH. You know, the stomach's very low, intestines not. Uh, and the presence of these lipids trigger this enterogastric reflex, which is going to slow down acid secretion in the stomach. Um, the low pH in the duodenum also triggers some hormones um, in the mucosa of the duodenum, um, secretin and GIP, the gastric inhibitory peptide. Both of those hormones, again, reduce acid secretion. Um, we, don't, we don't need any more acid secretion once the stomach is, is the contents of the stomach enter into the small intestine. All right, the motility of the stomach. Um, the motility enables three actions to receive food, churn it up, and then empty it into the in, in, intestine. So the receptive function in its resting state, the stomach can contain about 50 milliliters. Um, it can expand to 1,500 when filled with food and liquid. Um, as the food and liquid swallowed, that gastroesophageal sphincter and the smooth muscle of the fundus in the body relax. That allows the stomach to fill. This is known as receptive relaxation. Then the churning function begins. Um, and after a meal, the smooth muscle starts producing waves of peristalsis. Um, this is controlled by a group of cells called the gastric pacemaker. Um, now what the peristalsis does is it propels the polis to the pylorus. Um, and that's where small amounts of chyme are sent to the um, through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum at a time. The remainder of the chyme is pushed backward um, into the stomach where more peristalsis waves churn and mix up the chyme and this process continues to repeat. Um, the pacemaker controls the rate of peristaltic waves um, and it's constant at about three per minute. Then you have the emptying function, and this is the final part of the gastric motility. It controls moving the chyme into the duodenum. Of course, this is going to have to pass through the pyloric sphincter, and different things pass through at different rates. Liquids are obviously going to move pretty quickly. There's really no delay there, um, but solids eventually, uh, basically have to be converted into a liquid before they can get in there. Um, and the key factor that determines this rate of emptying is amount and the composition of that chyme into the the duodenum. Um, the control of gastric emptying is critical um, because the duodenum must mix the incoming chyme thoroughly before it moves to the, to the rest of the small intestine. And there's two reasons. Uh, the first chyme is acidic, so the duodenum has to mix it with bicarbonate so that it doesn't damage the intestinal mucosa. Uh, the intestinal intestines are not equipped to handle a low pH. So if a low pH gets there, it's going to damage the mucosa. That's where bicarbonate helps buffer that. Uh, the second is that the chyme is really concentrated, and it needs to be diluted with some water from the pancreatic juice to prevent that chyme from drawing water into the intestines by osmosis. Because you guys know water travels from high to low, so if there's not a lot of water inside the intestines, you're going to have an infiltration of that. Um, and then the duodenum can only process chyme so quickly. Um, it has to receive very small amounts at a time so that it can adjust uh, to that incoming chyme. Okay, we're going to stop there in this video. We will pick up in the, in the next video.